Well, good morning, St. Andrews. It's good to have your Bibles open with you as we look at Mark chapter 13 together, possibly the hardest chapter in the, the gospel. Well, every year, usually some things will go wrong. But this year, it felt like everything went wrong. First, there were citywide protests uh, in Hong Kong. And then we hear of huge bushfires sweeping across large parts of Australia, possibly killing as many as 500 million animals. And then a locust plague in East Africa. Now, swarms of little insects don't sound so bad until we hear that they can eat what 35,000 people would eat in one day. And so today, countries across East Africa face a severe food crisis. Then China locked down the entire city of Wuhan, population 11 million. And later, the WHO declares COVID-19 to be a global pandemic. And air travel stopped, borders closed, schools shut, and normal life as we know it came to a halt. Now, bad, bad as it is, this excludes massive hurricanes in Florida and volcano eruptions in the Philippines and riots across American cities, plane crash in Iran, chemical explosion in Beirut, wildfires across California, flooding in India, Olympics cancel in Japan, and on and on it goes. And 2020 is not even done yet. What's going on? Is this the end of the world? Now, when such things happen, many people want to know why. Is there a pattern? What, what signs should we look out for? How can we avoid catastrophe? And this is what Jesus' disciples wanted to know too. When catastrophes happen, it feels like the end of the world. Now, first, we have to put chapter 13 in context. Let's set the scene that this was the last week of Jesus' life. He had entered Jerusalem earlier with great fanfare and made his way to the temple, the, the religious center and the architectural monument at the highest point in the city. And that building was stunning in Jesus' time. It had taken 46 years to build. And some of the stone blocks on the base, they were 250 to 300 tons per brick. That's over 550,000 pounds. That's the weight of the entire Statue of Liberty. Now, from a distance, the temple would have looked like a mountain of gold gleaming atop uh, at, at that mountain plateau. Now, of course, the small town disciples, they were in awe when they looked up at it. What magnificent buildings they admired in verse 1. But here's the surprise. Look at verse 2. Jesus says, do you see all these buildings, these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. What? You know, this is the prediction that prompted them to ask in verse 4. Tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Now, it's important to keep this question in mind. Why? Because Jesus' answer actually has two time horizons in view. The first part, which is in verses 5 to 23, answers this immediate question. How will the temple end? Because they were incredulous and they were asking for signs to indicate when this would happen. So this first part is not about the end of the world. It's about the end of the temple. It's the second part from verse 24 onwards that Jesus looks beyond the temple. The destruction of the temple, unimaginable to his disciples, was a preview of a greater global apocalyptic event to come, the end of the present world order. Now, why do we make this distinction between the two? So that we don't confuse the two events and end up seeing the wrong signs. It's like driving on a road and you're following the wrong signs. It will lead you to the wrong place. When we don't we don't read these signs like conspiracy theories, else we're going to find all kinds of patterns when there are none. And like those immersed in conspiracy theories, we then live in a constant state of agitation, or of anger, or fear. You see, the point of these signs is so that we won't be misled by false prophets. That's what Jesus says in verse 5. You look down, it says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and deceive many. And he repeats this again in verse 21 to 23, which in effect frames this entire section, the first section. You look at verse 21, it sounds like verse 25, uh, verse 5 earlier. If anyone says to you, look here is the Messiah, look there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear 
and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. So Jesus' signs about the end of the temple is to preserve their faith so that they won't be misled, so that they won't be shaken and follow the wrong teachers who will lead them down the wrong paths, fixated on the wrong things. These signs also show us that Jesus is in control of history, that events don't happen at random, spiraling out of control. History is going somewhere. It's not going around in circles. And what seems unimaginable to them, the destruction of the temple, is actually to alert them of a greater destruction that is to come. You see, the end of the temple foreshadows the end of the present world order. When will this happen? Well, Jesus said plainly in verse 32, no one knows the day or the hour. The signs were not meant for us to speculate on the dates and times. Rather, they were given so that we will keep watch. Verse 35 and 37. And so we're going to unpack these two events and see the purposes behind the signs. And we're going to look at it in two, uh, two segments. The first part is from verses 5 to 23. For the signs of the temple, the point is, don't be misled by the false Christ. And for the signs of the end of the world, the second part, from verse 24 to the end, the purpose is to be ready to receive the true Christ. And so let's have a look at the first part, signs of the end of the temple from verses 5 to 23. And the point is don't be misled by false Christ. Now, Jesus gives a number of signs here to mark the end of the temple. And the first set of signs were general signs from verses 5 to 8. There will be a string of false saviors promising to rescue the Jewish nation, verses 5 to 6. There'll be reports of war and rumors of war, verse 7. A string of natural disasters, verse 8. You see, so these are general non-specific signs. Then Jesus will give the disciples specific signs for them from verses 9 to 13. They will, will be arrested and flogged in synagogues, verse 9. They will stand trial in courts, verse 11. Families torn apart, verse 12. Hatred towards them will grow and grow, verse 13. Now, if you think about it, verse 9 makes more sense in reference to the disciples in Jesus' time then as a sign for us today. Well, how so? Well, consider this. Why would Christians in the church today, the vast majority of us in our non-Jews living outside of Israel spread acro across the globe, why would the Christians in church today be arrested and beaten in Jewish synagogues? That's what Jesus says in verse 9. And, and so like birth pains, Jesus says, they won't know how long this labor will be but they need to be prepared for hard delivery. And then in verse 14, Jesus uses this unusual phrase, when you see the abomination that causes desolation. Jesus says, when you see that, then the end of the temple is imminent. That's the time to run. Don't even go home to pack. You run now, verses 15 to 20. Now that's a sure final sign of the end. The question is, what is it? Well, you see, this phrase is like a code word. It's found in the Old Testament book of Daniel, written more than 600 years prior, uh, foreseeing a future event. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, people in Jesus' time, they, can, they made the connection to an event that happened in the year 167 BC. It was one of the worst times of persecution in the history of the Jewish people. A powerful Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, he invaded and defeated Israel. And to show his utter dominance, to humiliate his fallen rivals, Antiochus set up an altar to the Greek god Zeus at the heart of the Jerusalem temple and sacrificed a pig on the altar, an unclean animal. And the Jews in Jesus' time would look back at that event and link it to Daniel's prophecy 600 years ago. So what are we to make of this? Well, Jesus tells us, don't be misled by false prophets. Verse 22, verse 23, be on your guard. You see, friends, every time when a nation faces a major crisis, could be a pandemic, war, plague, wildfires, many people are confused. We're, we're anxious, we're fearful. We're looking for someone to fix it. 
And often, many voices would also rush in to fill that vacuum to offer an explanation or solution. Maybe it'd be a preacher or a doctor or a president. They'll tell us to do this or to do that. But in the midst of all this anger and anxiety and confusion, who should we listen to? Is it true or fake news? Should we follow this person or that person? You see, fear can be distracting. Anxiety can be paralyzing. It takes our attention away from the most important things. It stops us from doing the most critical things. And that's what Jesus wants to prevent. He gave his disciples all these signs so that when catastrophe happens, when the temple falls, they won't be afraid. They won't be confused. They won't be distracted. They won't be deceived by the false Christ in verses 21 and 22. Instead, all the more they should fix their eyes on Jesus, the true Christ the one who had predicted that these things will come, to keep listening to his voice rather than to others, to keep pressing on doing what he commanded them. And so what about us today? What do you do when you're inundated with bad news? How, how do you feel when immersed 24-7 on social media newsfeed? In 2013, for example, the Swiss author, uh, Dr. Rolf Dobelli, he wrote a best-selling book uh, controversially with the title Stop Reading the News. That's the title of his book. And there he argues that our daily consumption of news is bad for our health. Like too much sugar is bad for our bodies. So too much news, Dobelli says, is bad for our minds. He says it's like brain candy, it's junk food for the mind. So he decided to give it up for the year, to stop reading, watching the news. And what happened? Did he miss out on important things? Not at all. Instead, he said he found it liberating. Too much bad news, the deluge of unrelated news led to distraction and confusion and inability to concentrate, anxiety and so on. And now he writes, he says, now I feel less disruption, more time, less anxiety, deeper thinking and more insights. Of course, I'm not suggesting uh, that we do what uh, Dr. Debelli said, uh, but certainly, we too might need to tune out the world more so that we can tune in to God instead. There are many voices competing, leading to confusion and anxiety when catastrophe happens. Instead, as the writer of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 to 3 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so that's the first section uh, in terms of signs of the end of the temple. And now we look at the signs of the end of the world from verses 24 to the end. And the point here is to be ready to receive the true Christ. You see, from talking about the end of the temple, Jesus now uh, switched gears and looks forward beyond Jerusalem to the end of the world. And we see this from a key phrase in verse 24, as well as the cosmic nature of the signs that he reveals. And the phrase in verse 24 is in those days, but in those days. This same phrase was often used in the Old Testament to refer to the end of time when everything in the universe is going to be radically changed forever. Now, earlier, you remember Jesus spoke about local things, uh, disciples being arrested, beaten in synagogues, people fleeing to the mountains, temple altar uh, defiled. But now Jesus is talking about cosmic things like the sun and the moon and the stars. You look at verse 24 to 25. It says, and the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give out its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And the question is, what do we make of this? Well, the first thing to note is that this was set in poetry and poetic language tends to be rich in imagery and metaphor. And its purpose is to evoke a feeling rather than to give mathematical accuracy. And the language here echoes that of earlier prophets in the Old Testament. The image of stars and sun and moon falling apart points to a radical reordering of the furniture of our created universe. Now, we have to appreciate that in the ancient Jewish mind, the destiny of the universe was tightly bound up with the destiny of the human race. What happens to one profoundly affects the other and vice versa. For example, when Adam and Eve sinned at the Garden of Eden, the consequences 
of their sins were not limited to them alone. Cursed is the ground because of you, God says in Genesis 3, verse 17. So you see, their sin spills over to affect the created world as well. And so in Genesis, when Adam sinned, the created world fell apart, if you like. It became dysfunctional. So now the created world that we're in, when it starts to unravel, then the question is, what then will happen to mankind? You see, if seeing the abomination that causes desolation, back in verse 14, if that was the sign of the imminent end of the temple, what's the sign of the imminent end of the world? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 26 to 27. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elects from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, again, Jesus echoes what was said by the earlier prophets here in Daniel chapter 7 about the Son of Man coming in the clouds. The imminent sign for the end of the world is going to be the second coming of Jesus. The Bible tells us that before the cross and the gospels reveal that Jesus came as a baby from a virgin birth. God Almighty, if you like, appeared incognito, unrecognized, uh, his divine identity concealed. But after his death and resurrection and ascension to heaven, the Bible tells us Jesus and Jesus himself tells us he will come again. Except this time his identity won't be hidden. It won't be just a few people in a small corner of Galilee that will see him. Verse 26 says he's going to come in the clouds with great power and glory. Now, in the Old Testament, whenever God appears, he was veiled in the clouds. Else the sight of God would be too overwhelming for mankind. And at his second coming, Jesus' divine identity, therefore, is going to be fully revealed. He's going to come in the clouds, but won't be veiled by the clouds. And all the people will see him and know about his return. And then in verse 27, he says, he will gather his elect from the four winds. He'll gather up all of his people and usher them into this new reality, a new heavens and a new earth. But this in-gathering won't include everyone. This, he will gather his elect, those that God has chosen. But the question is, what about the others? The Bible tells us they will stand before God's throne before Jesus to give an account of their lives. That day of rescue for God's people, the Bible says, will also be a day of judgment for everyone else. The day of the Lord. And Jesus underlines the uncertainty, the the certainty of this event in verses 28 to 31. In case anyone has doubts, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Verse 31. When will it happen? Verse 32, no one knows about the day or the hour. So the point of these signs is not for speculation. The point of Jesus giving the signs is for preparation. He says so in verse 34 to 35. You see, it's like a man going away, Jesus says. He leaves his house and puts his servant in charge, each with their assigned task. Everyone has something to do. And then he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. That's the point of the signs. What about us? Are we alert? Are we keeping watch? Are we living today in light of that great day? Are we living soberly, ready to serve, ready to obey, ready to love our neighbor, ready to do God's will? Or are we living today as if that day will never come? Living complacently, ready to indulge ourselves, ready to sin, to selfishly disengage from church and God and the world. Being ready to keep watch matters. Is he truly believing that Jesus will return again? Is will comfort us in our present sufferings that we We know that the pain and the trials will not be forever. And as well, knowing that Jesus will come again will give us strength and hope to keep persevering until the very end. Now, can such things be true? Can we believe such a thing as Jesus' second coming and the end of the world? Well, consider this. When Jesus told his disciples that the temple will end, they found they probably found it very hard to believe. 
It's like telling us, like, look, look at the Eiffel Tower in Paris, that will topple. Or, or the Petronas Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur, that's going to fall. Or Buckingham Palace in London, that will be crushed. You know, to us, it seems unimaginable, unlikely, isn't it? Because it, it would take a catastrophe of epic proportions for such a thing to happen, right? And yet, the Jerusalem temple did fall in the year 70 AD, conquered by the Romans. 700 years after that, another great empire rose and conquered Jerusalem. And today, a mosque sits exactly where the temple is supposed to be. And so, as the Apostle Peter said in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 9, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, friends, history is not a series of random events. It's the unfolding of his story, Jesus' story. It's heading towards the final and complete revelation of Jesus, the one true Christ. And the end of the Jerusalem temple foreshadows the coming end of our present world order. A new kingdom is surely on its way. And the king of kings is coming. The question for us is, do you know who he is? Will you be ready when he returns? Are you doing all that you can to prepare for that great day? Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, forgive us on the times that we live as if you're not going to return, that we live without hope and we live with fear and we live with anxiety. But instead, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we consider him so that we won't lose heart, so that we won't grow weary, so that we can persevere to the very end. Give us faith, Lord. Help us to live with that sense of urgency rather than complacency. Help us to persevere in faith uh, rather than to indulge uh, in our sinful desires. Help us, Lord, to continue to press on and to listen to Jesus rather than to listen to the cries of the world and the many false messiahs who might uh, seek to provide a solution, but will lead us down the wrong paths. We pray, Lord, that you, will, who have called us, will help us to be ready to meet with you on that great day. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Take care.